Hello and welcome back. I'm Nick and I help run Camp Zufari here at the Houston Zoo. We're bringing the zoo to you with Camp Zufari TV. I'm in the caves in our children's zoo to ask you all a couple questions. Are all snakes venomous? Are bats really blind? Can owls really turn their heads all the way around? Let's take a look at these animal myths and stories. Now a myth is something that many people believe is true, even if it's not. Many of these myths were created to explain how the world works before we really understood what was going on around us. Also, many people can't tell you when or where they first heard a myth. One common myth is that you can get warts just by touching a frog or a toad. Who came up with that? Now the myths today are about animals you might think are scary, gross, or creepy. But these animals actually have amazing adaptations that help them and us too. With some cool science and fact checking, we'll see if we can learn more about these animals and dispel some of those myths. To do that, I ask that each of you keep an open mind. For me, when I keep an open mind, I like to pop my mind open and take out all the negative thoughts and opinions I have that aren't based in fact. Things like, snakes are slimy. It's not a fact, I'm just gonna throw that away. Bats are creepy because they come out at night. Don't need that in there. Vultures are gross because of the food that they eat. Once I've tossed all those negative thoughts away, my mind is now open and ready for the facts we're gonna share. While we may not change your mind about some of these animals, hopefully with a little bit more information, we can help you find a way to still appreciate them. Let's start exploring. For all the fear and hate that snakes evoke, they inspire fascination like few other species. And here in Houston, Texas, rat snakes are the most common long snake in our area. At up to seven feet long, these snakes have dark blotches on lighter colored skin. Because of their coloring, many people confuse rat snakes with rattlesnakes. And that's just what the rat snake is hoping for. This non-venomous snake defends itself by using a fake out. Like some other snakes, they can rapidly whip the end of their tails back and forth against anything nearby to create a rattling sound. They're also very good climbers. So if you see a snake in a tree, it's most likely a rat snake, and he's up there doing his job. And boy, do these guys have an important job. Rat snakes help keep the local population of rats and mice in check. You'll find it snacking on small mammals, birds, and reptiles. And if you find one in your yard, you're lucky. That means you have your very own personal pest control officer. This is Ferdinand, and he's named after the man that discovered rat snakes in Texas. One Mr. Ferdinand Jacob Lindheimer. Whenever he is in training for his ambassador job, he likes to lay on his heating pad or sleep under his water bowl. It's quiz time! Stay tuned for more quizzes! Vultures tend to be a very misunderstood species that are often viewed as foul because their eating habits are associated with death, making them seem a little creepy. 
On the contrary, vultures are very beneficial birds that help the environment and people. In North America, we have three species of vulture you may have seen or heard of. Turkey vultures, black vultures, and California condors. They are commonly found in large groups near relatively open and clear spaces for scavenging and wooded tree areas for nesting. Turkey vultures have great eyesight and a good sense of smell to detect fresh carrion, which is a remarkable trait for a bird. Carrion is the term for carcasses that vultures eat. Most birds lack a strong nose. Black vultures are often seen nearby because they cannot smell the way turkey vultures can and will follow along to find carcasses. Their diet and preference for eating fresh carrion allows them to dispose of or consume meat that would have otherwise become a breeding ground for disease as it decayed. Vultures help keep the world a much cleaner place. If you have ever seen a vulture flying in circles, you may have wondered what they were doing. Some people think they hover over a sickly or dying animal waiting for them to pass for a free meal. This is a common misconception as we often see it and don't know how to explain the behavior. What is really happening is an example of static soaring, a really neat technique that some birds have to use rising thermals or air currents to stay up in the sky without having to flap their wings so much. It just so happens that the spaces vultures do this might seem to look desolate out over an empty field or hot stretch of desert because of how air currents work. You don't usually get good lift right by the tree line. Here at the Houston Zoo, we have a black vulture deadly who lives in the children's zoo and two king vultures. Time for another quiz. quizzes to come. Dragons of legend are often described similarly to actual creatures that lived in the past or are found present day, many of them covered in scales with reptile-like features. Dragons were generally depicted as evil and destructive, laying ruin to the land. Most cultures have myths about dragons. They are a combination of people's fears, mysteries, and imaginations. For a long time, there was a debate about how a Komodo dragon would catch and kill their prey. Komodo dragons will eat carrion like a vulture, but prefer fresh meat. The belief was that when eating rotting food, they would develop lots of nasty bacteria and germs in their mouth. Then, by biting at their prey, those same germs would cause an infection that would take down the prey animal. At the Houston Zoo, we think dragons are pretty cool like Boga here. Boga is a 12-year-old male Komodo dragon who lives at the reptile and amphibian house. Boga loves to use his strong jaws and sharp teeth to eat one of his favorite treats, ostrich eggs. Komodo dragons are the world's largest lizards, and males like Boga can grow up to 10 feet and weigh 170 pounds. Boga's still growing, he is currently just over six feet long and weighs nearly a hundred pounds. While adult Komodo dragons are ground dwelling due to their size, juveniles live in trees, feeding on insects and other small creatures for the first four to five years of their lives. 
Let's check your animal knowledge. We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. Are you? One of the biggest myths I hear at the zoo is that only adults can help save animals and there's nothing for children to do. And that's false. There are things everyone can do to help save animals in the wild. Just by visiting the zoo, you're helping us save animals around the globe. But there are also things you can do closer to home to help. Every time you use a reusable cup or reusable water bottle, you're helping to save marine animals like sea lions, sea turtles, and pelicans right here along the coast. Another way people can help is to make their communities more animal friendly. A lot of animals featured in myths, like bugs and bats, live in easy to build pollinator palaces or bat houses. These animals might not be seen very often, but having homes in your neighborhood can help cut down on pests, like mosquitoes in the summertime. This is an example of a bat box. It's just a little box with a roost for bats to crawl up inside to stay safe during the day. It helps keep the weather off and protect them from daytime predators. With your parents' help, you can go online and find all sorts of plans on how to build one of these at home. Remember your sit spot from last week? An addition like this would be a great way to improve the environment around you. Another example is a pollinator palace. Inside are all sorts of nooks and crannies to help insects that help make your gardens look beautiful. Next time you're at the zoo, we have these everywhere. See how many you can find. A reusable bag is another way that everyone can help. As a bonus, reusal bags are super easy to make. All you need is an old t-shirt and a pair of scissors. Let me show you how to do it. To make a reusable bag, the first thing we're gonna do is cut both sleeves off of our t-shirt. These cuts don't have to look pretty or nice because we can always come back and trim them up once we're done. One sleeve gone. Once the sleeves are gone, I'm gonna cut an opening around the neckline of the shirt. The bigger the opening, the larger the opening in our bag to put stuff in or pull stuff out. So there's the shirt with no sleeves. Now I'm gonna cut a U right around the top of the neck. Again, this cut does not have to be a pretty finished cut because we can always come back and trim it up to make it look a little bit nicer once we're finished. There we go. So now we have the opening for a bag. The last step, or next step, is to cut some fringe into the bottom of the shirt. So holding the shirt closed, I'm just gonna cut little strips up the side of the shirt. Just a couple cuts. The more I cut, the easier it gets. Once we have these cuts done, we needed to figure out if we want the fringe that I'm cutting to hang outside the bag or be hidden inside the bag. So what we're gonna do is tie the fringe together to close up the bottom of our shirt. All right. So now with our fringe cut, all I'm gonna do is start at one side, pull the fringe apart, and tie two little knots one and two in the fringe and then work my way down the shirt. The reason I put two knots in 
is the first knot closes the bag, and the second knot will help keep it from opening once we start to put stuff in it. Once you've got all your knots tied, you flip your shirt over and you've got a reusable bag. If you don't like the fringe at the bottom, before you tie your bags or tie your knots, you can flip it inside out to tie them so that all of that fringe ends up on the inside. Make-believe characters in the highly popular book Dracula by Bram Stoker and many movies over the years have given bats an evil and sinister rep. In Western cultures, bats are often associated with creepy caves and Halloween. However, in Chinese and Polish cultures, bats are a symbol of both life and good luck. There are 17 families of bats and they're divided into two suborders, megabats and microbats. Megabats include some of the largest bats known, including the giant flying fox of Africa. Megabats are characterized by large eyes and fox-like faces. Their long snouts are good for smelling for food and helping to pollinate flowers. Microbats, on the other hand, have poor vision and use echolocation to find out what's around them and detect their food and prey, which includes insects, fish, and frogs. Vampire bats are microbats, and there are only three species that feed on the blood of mammals. Their sharp needle-like teeth make small incisions in the prey's back and they lap up the blood droplets. At most, they can only take about a tablespoon of blood each night from their prey. Bats are wonderfully beneficial animals that provide invaluable resources to the environment and to humans. There are more than 13,000 different species of bats in the world and they make up 20% of all mammals. Myths range from bats are blind, to all bats drink blood, and all bats are rabid. None of these are true. These pint-sized creatures are responsible for keeping the Earth's bug populations in check. They also help to pollinate plants and disperse seeds for a wide range of plants and crops that we rely on for food. It just depends on the species. Here in Houston, we have a Mexican free-tail bat colony under Wall Bridge, and people can watch them emerge each night to go devour two tons of insects. There is an even larger colony in Central Texas that has millions of individuals, as well as a colony in Austin. It's estimated that bats that eat insects help save our economy billions of dollars in crop losses. Without them, our food might look very different. The bats we have in the children's zoo cave are Seba's short-tailed bats and Paula's long-tongued nectar bats. They're a fruit-loving species that is native to Mexico and Central South America. They feed on about 50 different species of fruit and are responsible for helping disperse their seeds in the forest. Bats help plants grow. The polis bats, in particular, feed on nectar and you can see them at their feeders in their cave. They have specially adapted tongues that act as mops to wipe up the nectar. We even have some native bats that live here on zoo grounds. They help control the bug population around our Texas wetlands habitat. Welcome back. Let's check your animal knowledge. Keep watching for more quizzes. Owls have been a part of myths for a very long time. Many false ideas have unfortunately given owls a bad reputation and people often misunderstood their environmental importance and role. While they might have big eyes, hoot and make other noises during different times of the day and fly silently, these are all important adaptations that allow owls to survive. 
Lots of people also think owls can turn their head all the way around, but that's just a myth. With 14 neck bones, that's twice as many as humans, the extra bones allow owls to turn their head 270 degrees or three quarters of a circle. Their eyes are so big that they can't move them from side to side like we can. They can only look straight ahead. That's why they have to turn their whole head to look around. In our children's zoo, we have two burrowing owls. This small species spends its time often on the ground hiding out in their burrows or protecting the entrance. They may dig the burrows themselves or take over a space left behind by prairie dogs, ground squirrels, or tortoises. Cowboys sometimes used to call them howdy birds because it seemed they would nod their head in greeting as they passed. They're helpful birds because they eat a lot of insect species and will pick off venomous critters like scorpions and centipedes. We also have the adorable Texas natives, our eastern screech owls. Guinevere is our newest screech owl and was named after Lady Guinevere from the Arthurian legends. Since owls need trees to live, it's important for us to conserve paper. At the zoo, we're continuing our efforts to save forests and the animals that live in them, like owls, by using recycled content toilet paper. The average household uses 120 rolls of toilet paper each year. That's one roll every three days. 27,000 trees are cut down every single day to provide toilet paper for the world. These trees are important habitat for animals like chimpanzees, macaws, and owls. By using recycled content toilet paper, we can all help save important animal habitats. Time for another quiz. Did you learn something new about an animal you might have thought was creepy? Are you still keeping an open mind? Good, because I want to introduce you to my friend Blondie. Blondie is a rose-haired tarantula and she came to the zoo back in 2007, which makes her at least 13 years old. These tarantulas can live for different periods of time. The boys only usually live to be about five years old, but girls like Blondie here can live to be up to 20. This species is native to Chile and the Atacama Desert, where they live in burrows. They can spin silk, but they're not going to build a big web like you might think of when you think of other spiders. Instead, they line their burrow with the silk, which acts like a tripwire, letting Blondie know when other animals or people are nearby. And this is perfect because she has such tiny eyes, it makes it difficult to see. Also, the silk makes a wonderful pillow. She's a very calm and docile spider, and she does really well when we bring her out to meet people. The one thing she doesn't like, though, is when we change the dirt in her enclosure. She'll climb on top of her log house and wait for us to put in the new dirt and leave, and she'll stay up there for a while before she finally ventures back down to check out her new home. While tarantulas like Blondie do have a mild venom, it's not particularly dangerous to people. Instead, the reason I have these gloves on is that her abdomen is covered in special hairs called urticating hairs. Urtica in Latin is a word that means nettle, and just like the nettles on certain plants, those hairs are barbed. If Blondie feels threatened, she can eject those hairs towards the threat. It'd be like getting a mouthful or face full of splinters as an added bonus to keeping my hands safe, these gloves also give her better footing so she can walk around. 
Another adaptation Blondie has are on the end of all eight of her legs. If you look really closely, you'll notice these tiny, tiny little claws, almost like a cat's claws, that enable her to grab on and climb with ease. While she lives down in her burrows underground, she could very easily climb up a tree with no problem. I hope you all learned something today and have a better appreciation for the animals that we visited. Join us next week as we bring the zoo to you. Bye! Hi, I'm Lee Emke, the President and CEO of the Houston Zoo. After more than two months of being closed, we are ready and excited to welcome you back to reconnect with the animals you know and love. To ensure the health and safety of you, your family, and our animals, here are a few of the modifications you can expect during your next visit. The Houston Zoo is now accepting advanced reservations online only for all visitors and zoo members at HoustonZoo.org for the health and safety of our guests, staff, and animals, and to ensure adequate social distancing, a limited number of timed tickets will be available each day and only available online at HoustonZoo.org. Pick the day and time you'd like to visit, and you will receive an electronic ticket that can be scanned by one of our team members when you arrive. Once inside, guests will follow a modified one-way path through the zoo to see many of their favorite animals in outdoor wildlife habitats, including elephants, rhinos, gorillas, lions, and many more. Guests will not have access to indoor animal exhibits or high-touch areas of the zoo. Some sit-down restaurants are open at limited capacity, and food and beverages are available for purchase at multiple locations, all food and beverage locations are credit card only. All zoo staff are required to wear masks while working. And as recommended by the Houston Health Department and the CDC, guests are strongly encouraged to wear a face covering when visiting the zoo. Hand sanitizer stations are positioned at the entrance and exit and along the path, including restrooms and food locations. Zoo staff will disinfect all high-touch surfaces, including vending machines, tables, chairs, and more. For more detailed information, and to reserve your ticket, visit HoustonZoo.org.